I knew this would be a popular session. This is going to be lots of fun stuff you're going to see. So we're going a little bit out of order from, I believe, what the schedule may have said. Jacob Cook is here from um, Sweet Onion Creations. I love that name. Hailing from Bozeman, Montana. And he's going to talk about what he does, some fun stuff. So welcome him. Thank you. Thanks. We just want to say a big thank you to the SketchUp team for having us down out of Montana. It's been a blast the last few days. We've had a great time seeing what everybody's doing with SketchUp. Um, what we're going to talk about a little bit is 3D printing. Has anybody in the audience seen 3D printing? Or All right. This is the most I've ever seen. This is great. So um, what we'll do is we're going to show you how we took the Googleplex last week. We downloaded this off of Warehouse and built it out on a 3D printer. And we'll kind of got a video and I'll kind of talk you through it. A lot of people have already seen this, so it'll be kind of a little bit of a review probably. I'm going to talk a little bit about file formats for 3D printing. Um, this can be a little bit kind of a, a messy area to get into, but I'm going to just kind of go over it real at a high level so you understand kind of how a 3D printer is uh, using a SketchUp file. And a couple case studies of some stuff we've worked with with some clients around the country. So the first thing we did, this was done up in Bozeman. And um, so we just went to Warehouse, and we just typed in Googleplex. I want to make sure you see it all start to finish, you know. <laughs> um, there was actually two models of the Googleplex, one without the solar panels, one with the solar panels. And we thought the solar panels was a really cool idea, so that's the one we chose to build. So we're going to download that. And we are in Montana, so the internet is a little bit slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got further to go, exactly. Um, so we just pull it up in SketchUp and we're kind of looking through it. Um, there's a couple issues, and I'll explain this in a little bit, on uh, how to fix this for the 3D printer. But you basically get an idea of what the, what the layout looks like. And now this is um, how it looks like on our machine in the software before it goes to the printer. And we're going to start off here. And 3D printing basically works by assembling layers. So what we've done now is we've, we're filming it, and you'll see it in different stages, but the very bottom is the base of the model, which is just basically a big rectangle. So it's assembling that. Um, you can kind of see on the left-hand side there's the Google logo. And this is a little bit higher up on the model, and it's building some of the other buildings out, the walkways and stuff back and forth. And finally here, it's getting to the top of the model, and it's just the little tips of the very tallest buildings on the campus here. And basically all that's doing is it's taking a, uh, one side has loose powder, one side is solid powder. And you'll see this in a second, some of the loose powder. Um, on the left-hand side is the box of loose powder, and it squirts the layer back. And then it traces out basically a pancake of that uh, shape. And as you raise it up, the loose powder kind of falls away. And the nice thing with this is we're able to recycle this back through the machine. So that loose powder actually supports the structure as it's being built, and then it's recycled back through. So now we've kind of got the perimeter at least marked out, and we're going to pull it out. And now, I think this is my, the coolest part of the whole process, is you actually blow off all the excess powder, and you're left with the structure. Um, and you have to be kind of careful, because if you get too crazy with the airbrush, you can actually break it um, if you get too, too excited. But basically, that's the whole structure. You can see the solar panels that are kind of in the parking lot on the west end of campus here. And there's the Google logo at the top. And um, that's basically how it, how it is. And you're more than welcome. So here's the completed model. So if you want to, feel free to come up. You're welcome to pick it up, touch it, and see it. Um, in a little bit, I'll show you some of the issues that we had to kind of get by to make it work. But basically, I mean, that's the Googleplex. The only thing is I wish there was a, a sign for Charlie's Cafe, because uh, that's been my favorite part of the <laughs> visit so far. So STL files, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview. There's a lot of different 3D printing technologies out there. And almost all of them read what they call an STL file. And what that stands for is stereolithography. But I think this is the best definition, is it's stupid triangles and lots of them. <laughs> so basically how it's doing is it's taking any shape, and it's basically trying to draw it using triangles. So you can take that and represent it like that, basically. But at the end of the day, what you want to try and remember with STL files is it's just a mesh. That's all this is, is it's a mesh made out of triangles. And that's what allows the machine to kind of slice stuff up in layer and see surfaces and construct it over time. 
So what happens if you don't pay attention to the mesh and you just try and ignore it? And the software will tell you you shouldn't do it, but you can push your luck like we did here. And on the right-hand side, that whole wall out of SketchUp wasn't built completely solid and fused together. And so what happens is if you don't pay attention and clean the mesh up, it'll basically spill through. And what's happening is the machine can't see what that pancake layer looks like, so it goes to trace that ring out in the powder and it doesn't put anything down, so it basically just falls through. So it's just kind of a bummer and you got to start over and fix the file. And one thing I was going to say, if anybody has any questions as I'm going through this, feel free to raise your hand and, yes? Oh, so the question is, what model of 3D printer are we using? We use um, Z Corporation, which is a company out of Boston, and it's a 310 plus. So this is um, just a, a screenshot from the Googleplex model. And if you can kind of see here, the issues that we face with SketchUp is um, some of the posts that are modeled to hold it up and the actual solar panels are just a thin plane. And so for it to build that, the machine has to see a mass. And if there's not a mass there, it can't construct a physical object. So one thing, I guess a, the biggest tip today, if you're ever thinking about going to a 3D printer, is as you're modeling stuff in SketchUp, try and make that a solid mass as, as much as possible as you go through it. So this is a case study that I thought I'd show real quick. Uh, this is a firm that came to us and they asked, can you work with SketchUp files? And this is kind of how we stumbled across this. Uh, we were originally a garage startup out of Montana, so you know when someone calls with business, you're like, yeah, sure, we can, we can do that, no problem. <laughs> and we kind of hung up the phone, and it was like six weeks of finals in school all over again. But we figured out what they wanted to do was take this whole city of Jacksonville, Florida. A lot of it had been modeled and put up on warehouse, and they wanted to basically pull that off and build a scale model. And it's kind of tough to get a sense, but this model is actually about seven feet by four feet. So it's modeled about one eighteen hundredth scale. And so we basically pulled them off. There's almost a thousand buildings here, but all the major landmarks and everything were pulled off, and the roadways. And my favorite part is kind of the upper right-hand corner. You can see the cruise ship. That came right out of warehouse as well. So um, there's another picture here you can kind of see. Um, the model is painted different colors, so potential areas, new ideas, existing, everything like that has a key that kind of matches up with it. But the nice thing is, I mean, that's some of these structures would be almost impossible to make by hand, and they take forever to model in a traditional CAD package. And with SketchUp, there's a great way just for them to really get a bunch of concepts together really quickly. And so this is kind of the towards the tail end here. Um, this is the Disney Concert Hall, and I thought this was kind of a neat idea for what's really different for shapes that you can build out of SketchUp. And I'll show you a little bit of a video here. You can kind of get a sense. If you've been to downtown Los Angeles, it's really out there in terms of what else is around for surrounding architecture. And I apologize for uh, the car sickness on the video. <laughs> so basically, same idea. We're going to take that. It's been modeled by Google. We're going to on warehouse. We're going to download it. And same thing, we're going to blow off the powder. We've got to show that again, because I think that's the coolest part of the whole process. And so a lot of people say, well, how long does it take to do this? And we're basically, you know, you can grab that model, you can download it and pull it up. And this is, you know, off the web and in your hands in a couple hours, basically, depending on how messy that file can be to, to clean up. And the kind of neat thing is, you know, if you want to do a, you can go on site and get a sense of it, you can, you know, this was built really small to get through airport security, so. <laughs> so that is basically. Um, 3D printing off of SketchUp in a very, very short amount of time. <laughs> oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, for the Google model, for example, how long does that take to print? So the question is, how long does it take to build this model here, which is the Googleplex? Um, this was about an hour and 15 minutes once the CAD file is already cleaned up and ready to roll. Um, so it's actually pretty quick. And then the, the you know, removing the powder and putting, we put a hardening agent on it so it'll get through uh, shipping and everything like that. So that can take another hour and a half, two hours, depending on how delicate it is. So um, how much would you charge for that one? Char how much would the, the cost be for that one? The big variable there is what shape that CAD file's in. So if the CAD file's cleaned up and it's ready to go, this one would be anywhere from three to $500, roughly depending. If the, it wants to be a full color model, that obviously takes a lot more time. We do all our models by hand, we paint them and match them off like a Photoshop press quality picture and try and match them up that way. So there was one gentleman right back here that had his hand up before. Well, I was just curious, you said cleaning up sounds like it's still a hand job. 
<laughs> That's a great, so the question was the cleaning up and it, how time intensive it is. And there is some Ruby scripts and I believe on the download I put a link in there to a discussion forum. And so the STL exports, it's getting there and it's pretty good but there's some, some software we use that's designed just for fixing those files that makes it a lot easier. It goes pretty, pretty fast. Yes? Two questions. Does SketchUp export STL and what are the maximum dimensions of the uh, module? Okay, so the question is does uh, SketchUp export STL and what's the maximum dimensions that we can make. Uh, the Ruby script will let you export out as an STL file, I believe. Um, we're able to just kind of grab that native SKP file and work with that. So we kind of go that route. Um, and I know some people have been asking a lot about exporting out as an STL. I think the, the go to school guys were talking about that. They've seen a lot of that on their forums. So I think it's going to be there for sure. And I, I, haven't, I haven't personally worked with the script that much to see how good the quality is coming out. Um, and to answer your second question regarding size, um, basically you can set it up and put them together like a Lego set. So you, however big you want that model to be, you can just slice it up on the CAD side and assemble it as it comes out. Where's and the biggest piece? The biggest piece is actually 8 by 10 inches for the machine we use, by 8 inches tall. So, um, any other questions? Yes? How expensive is the machine? How expensive is the machine? Um, they're running around $30,000 for a machine. There's um, some open source stuff about how to do 3D printing um, that's going to, I think, probably come down. I've heard rumors on blogs that people are trying to, I think, I can't remember the company, they're trying to get a, an application out for five grand for a desktop 3D printer. So I think that's definitely coming. Yes? So the question is, do you have to build support structures as it's getting built? There's other 3D printing processes where you do have to do that, and there's quite a bit of waste as a result. The nice thing with using the powder process is we don't have to do that. So that, all that excess powder that you saw kind of fall away actually serves to support it as well as it's when it's in the build area. So that's nice. Yes? So how thin a wall can you end up doing if you've got a compound shape? That's a great question. So how thin is the wall that you can do? Um, it kind of depends, like so this topography model, and it's up here if you want to touch it and play with it or whatever. Um, if you can get around a sixteenth of an inch, you're, you're doing pretty good. Like on the bottom of that one, if you want to make real thin walls, you want to have cut holes in it to drain the powder out and kind of leave it there so that that's not trying to push out. Once you get the, uh, the hardening agent on it, you're pretty much good to go. So it can be pretty thin, but it's, when I was blowing that powder off, if those are real delicate, that can take hours because one, you know, you get too hard on a squirt and phew, you got to start over. So, yes? Do you use other RP methods? Do we use other RP methods? Currently to date we don't. We found that the powder process for architecture is the tolerances are usually within the scale. And the second thing is it's a little bit more affordable. Other RP methods, they'll be about four times the cost of this. So, yeah, seems to be most affordable for that. Any other questions? The ability to do characters. There's actually a company that is doing that. A lot of stuff out of Second Life. They're taking avatars and downloading those and doing them in full color. Um, I think they're out of Seattle. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But yeah, you, you can do that. We've kind of just focused on architecture and design and stuff, but there is people that are definitely doing characters. Yeah. If you have any other questions, my email is just jake at Sweet Onion Creations. If something comes up, feel free to shoot me an email. And uh, thanks for your time. Hello everyone, um, welcome to Cool Stuff for SketchUp. Um, my name is John Martin and I am Vice President of Product Marketing for Realusion and uh, in charge of our iClone and uh, real-time 3D animation software. Um, what we're going to show you today is a little different than what many of you may have seen here so far. Um, just now that you know me, I'd like to know you a little bit. How many people in the room here are architects? Okay, how many people in here are in uh, some sort of entertainment industry or content production? Yep. How many people in here have ever heard of the term machinima? Okay, cool, cool, good, excellent. Um, 
couple more questions. How many people in here was SketchUp your first tool ever? I mean, first tool ever, ever, right? Before you walk. Your first 3D modeling tool. Do you? Okay, great. What I'm going to demonstrate to you today is, I, is iClone, which we hope can become your first 3D animation tool. What we've combined is the simplicity of approaching 3D modeling along with the animation um, capabilities real of real-time animation inside iClone. I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're talking about. Everything begins with what we have as the avatar. So we're talking about populating your models or your scenes that you're creating in SketchUp with people that you can then inhabit um, you know, what you're making. Everything's done with a single digital photograph to build your characters inside iClone. What we do is we'll import any JPEG or bitmap and use some simple fitting tools to be able to actually take a person, a real photo of a person, and instantly transform them into a 3D model that you can um, then place into the scene and the model not only can move because it's already rigged for animation and we're providing you with a number of motion capture files that you can use to instantly animate the model to make it walk or run or sit and you know converse in a room or whatever you'd like to do these models are also equipped for facial animation which is another core of what we do with Reillusion and allowing you to take a character and then once it's created, um, the interface allows you to quickly move through the different elements of the software, whether it be motion or whether it be um, you know, different things to customize the character. Uh, in this particular scene, we're not actually doing a visualization of a home. I'll show you a little bit of that in a moment. But we're showing you something that our software is very widely used for, and that's this new era of storytelling that we're in now. And when I mentioned the word machinima, machinima is really the, the term that's, that's, that's on the frontier of what this new level of you know, one person, one desktop, one movie movement is doing right now. So whenever you bring the character into Crazy Talk, um, you have a number of different, uh, different categories that you can edit, whether it be the hair or the scale for the character's body shape. Um, as you can see, we, we've given him a nice sword there so he can, he can uh, fight his way through the scene here in a moment and really work on building this in real time because it's what it's all about. It's about instead of you know, massive time spent trying to figure out how to put a scene together, and this is even if you're talking about having people walk through, for all you architects that are here, having people walk through a simple scene. Maybe you want to populate a strip mall that's, you know, that you've elevated um, with SketchUp then we have the tools not only, you know, if you want a sword fighter for your scene, then you'll have that, but we also have the ability for you to instantly put in those characters. But there's more with iClone um, that we can show you as well um, that can also work along the lines of SketchUp. And the reason why Reillusion, uh, why we were invited um, to come to 3D Basecamp, which we're very happy to, to do, um, was because last year, uh, last uh, October in 2000, we started optimizing a model conversion uh, tool that we have called 3D Exchange. And we started working with Steve Dapkus and Bruce Polderman in the Boulder office uh, to optimize this software so that our users could take, uh, take advantage of not only the free modeling tool of SketchUp, but also the massive library of models available inside 3D Warehouse because our customers mostly um, are coming into animation and media production not from the modeling world, not from the uh, construction or architectural world, but they're coming to it from the fact that their kids play video games, or maybe they play video games, or they watch animated movies and they say, I love that. Well, now they can do some things like that. So content is something that we were really challenged with uh, to either build our own to create massive libraries, which we also do, um, or to be able to utilize um, awesome technologies like SketchUp to allow our, our users to create their models. Um, not only that, but we also have uh, a competition on uh, SketchUp or on Google 3D Warehouse now called Film the World. And so what we ask people to do is take this technology that allows you to search for a model and then be able to actually tell a story with it inside our animation software. 
So I'll just do a quick search here so you can see some of these. Um, if, if you've ever done much looking around in the 3D warehouse, how many people use 3D warehouse fairly regularly? Awesome, cool. This tool um, is, is absolutely awesome for our community because whenever they come in here, they can say, I want a city or I want a, I want, uh, you know, a building or whatever it is they might need for their scene and then instantly be able to get that. And in this example, not only can they get that, but if they want to shoot on location in Denver, Colorado in their virtual movie, they can do that just by going to the warehouse, finding some of the great uh, buildings that have made inside uh, or for the city of Denver and then being able to just download that model and then put it into our software. So we'll download the model directly from 3D Warehouse and then that gets brought into our model conversion tool called iClone 3D Exchange. Now in 3D Exchange what happens is this, you can adjust the smoothing of the model. Uh, a lot of times you'll get a lot of models that have faceted edges and that sort of thing. You can smooth the model very well here. You can also uh, change things like the specularity of the model. You can change the glow uh, or the glossiness, the opacity. Um, you download a car. Most cars um, in the 3D warehouse have opaque windshields. We want to put characters inside those cars for for iClone. So what we do is we'll take that car and we'll change the opacity on the windshield and obviously our characters then can sit in it and the, and the camera is able to see it. So we could take a model like this and although we really love the data from Google Earth, um, it's something that normally what we'll do is optional. We can take that out and then we're left with just the pure model. And we can go ahead and export that as a prop for our library inside iClone. Now once that is in there, you can go into iClone and then go to our different section for scene, um, switching out of the character mode into scene, and then you can go to our props section. And then from the props section, locate the model uh, that, you, that you just created from 3D Warehouse. And then we can put that into the scene. Now once that's in iClone, what more can we do with it? When that comes in, we're able to change the lighting. We can have the scene be daytime. We can have the scene be nighttime. We can add a torrential downpour of, of, of rain instantly with the real-time particle effects that iClone provides into the software. All of that can be done to be able to fully build out your model and then film your scene. So we have our character back here. Now we need to do is just bring our model a little closer. And then we can set up our scene once we do that. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the, 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 the famous cooking show trick. We've got one in the oven we're going to bring out um, so you can see that. And go into our custom folder here for our projects. Sorry, I'm doing, I'm, I'm fishing for a moment real quick here. There we go. So what we did is we actually went and, and because so much of Denver is, has been modeled, it's really fascinating to look and see. I lived in Denver for a number of years, so for me it's like getting a chance to kind of go back home again and look around. Um, we downloaded a number of the, the models from the streets there in the surrounding area. And then once we did that, we were able to bring in some people and just create a really fast scene. So, you know, nothing, nothing super special going on here, but you can see we've added some uh, props with uh, the vehicles. Uh, we've added some uh, different street textures. Uh, we have what we call our citizen extras, which are low poly people. So um, the real time rendering, as you see here, um, can actually be done rather fast. So it's a tool that really allows you to take that next step with SketchUp. 
and allow your scenes to come to life. And if you're doing visualizations, whether you're doing actual buildings um, or if you're working uh, with equipment uh, that you're doing visualizations, engines, the artificial heart, whatever it may be, um, iClone really has a solution for you to then take that video visualization and go a step further with this. Um, as far as what you can see for uh, this uh, on, the, on the market, this software retails at $199 for the complete package, so it's very affordable for your studio to be able to bring into that. Um, you can certainly learn a lot more at reillusion.com, and uh, feel free to email me. Uh, my name's John again, and uh, if anyone has any questions, i definitely like to take them. How, how are we on time? Okay. Yeah? Any questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Can you export this into like Studio or something The idea with iClone is actually what you will do from here is you will export that and bring it uh, or export it as a video. So you can export from HD 1080i video all the way down to something that you would put on your mobile handset and uh, show with 3GP video. So um, it's, it supports HD. You can, you can uh, export Flash. Uh, from this as well for websites and that sort of thing. But the major output is video uh, from this software. So you bring all your content here and then complete your file and, and output the video. Absolutely. You, whatever you model in SketchUp, it's fully SKP compatible, the SketchUp file format. So you can bring in any SKP, 3DS, OBJ, all those file formats can be brought in from third-party uh, modeling tools or libraries and then added to your scenes for animation inside iCloud. They, they kind of contain this, the, the, the images that you're, that you're applied, right? Right, right. The, the, um, if it's an OBJ, you need to have like the MTL file for the material. Um, but as far as SketchUp goes for SKP, everything that you see in SketchUp will translate here. Um, and then in the traveling there too, or into iClone, um, you can smooth your models, you can you know, add specularity so metal actually shines like metal, that sort of thing. Um, and that's, but yes, you can. Yes, sir. Mm hmm. Cur yeah, currently we don't, uh, we don't import the cameras from, from SketchUp at the moment, um, but we do have a camera system here and timeline for you to be able to plot that how you would here. It's going to be a little different going from that software into this for, um, for the cameras. Yeah. Um, okay. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, you can have people inside, outside. We have, we have uh, what we call uh, interactive props so that you can actually have a door that um, has animation for opening and closing. And you can say at one point on the timeline, open the door, close the door, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. You can also have shadows. You can have shadows. Um, yep, absolutely. Um, you can turn on the shadows. I'll just bring up another project here. Also, there's um, the foliage um, that you can bring into iClone. I'll just show that in this as well. Um, uh, the real-time foliage, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar, let me know. Um, Speed Tree is what we use inside this software, and it's what you'll find in most of the uh, top PSP ti or uh, PlayStation titles or Xbox titles uh, would be Speed Tree. And so that allows us to have real-time uh, you know, wind and, and uh, resistance and that sort of thing, animation for your vegetation so that you can immediately say, put a building you know, here, here's flowers, Here's a hedge, here's grass, trees, that sort of thing, um, to be able to bring that into iClone. And then you can also visualize that uh, in full screen if it'll go. There we go. So that's real time in, in, in uh, full screen there. So it really cuts down on any kind of render time. It takes the guesswork out of uh, working with the software. You can create what you need on the fly. You know, we're working on it. Uh, we, we planned, uh, maybe you guys can give us some tips on what we're going to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is the backdrop a dome? It is. It's a sky dome, um, and so um, we do, you know we do the sky dome in that. Um, it's also able to be animated, um, and then we have atmospherics that you can add for fog. That's uh, that that uh, is like a depth of field effect in the distance for your atmospherics that way. Yes, sir. Yeah, 
Right. Um, this um, actually we are. This 2.5 is where we are right now. 3.0, um, we're, we're debuting on July 15th. July 15th, brand new camera system, Bezier Curve, um, all of that is in there. M multiple cameras, camera switching, all that. Yep. Yes, sir. We do actually, I'll show you real quick our home um, inside. Uh, Google 3D warehouse and so if you just go to the Google 3D warehouse the question was will our li will there be libraries of our characters available to you for your SketchUp projects um, and we we have done that uh, and we'll continue to do that inside um, Reillusion iClone is the name of uh, the, our um, username here um, on 3D Warehouse, and then inside that you can see a number of models uh, from different uh, plants um, to different park scenes and street scenes. People in certain poses are there, and uh, the quality on those are actually pretty high. Um, we've, gotten, we've gotten good ratings, uh, so that's, that's cool. The, the community does a good job of letting us know whether we're doing okay or not. So, um, But yeah, all of those are available uh, and free to use inside your, you know, your projects commercially as well. Yes, sir. Um, in, in this current version with iClone 2.5, we have a quick shader mode and we have a pixel shader mode. Uh, the question was, could we showcase anything in wireframe or bounding box or something like that? Um, 2.5 allows you to either do pixel shader or quick shader. Um, the, uh, iClone 3, like I said, that we're debuting in July 15th, has wireframe bounding box, uh, quick shader, vertex shader, and pixel shader all as options. How long does it take to render a scene like that? A scene like this um, actually doesn't take very long at all. Uh, the rendering is really fast with this because you're, you're dealing with, you know, like uh, optimized, um, you know, optimized scenes already. So these scenes are really optimized for lower poly count to begin with. Um, if you bring in, you know, a massive model in there, obviously render time is going to slow down a little bit. Um, but uh, the, the rendering engine is actually quite fast here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I kind of like the spinning propellers. You know, that's that's you got to got to spin the propellers. That was actually a static model that we downloaded. I think that was a Turbo Squid model, actually. Um, and then in iClone, again with 3D Exchange, the question was, can we spin the propeller of the of the airship back here? Um, you can take models that are made up of. Um, uh, I guess the the term here would be it's like a component. Okay, so you take like what in iClone would be like a component with different objects inside. You can split that up and then you have a single timeline for just every object. So you can do your 360 spin on the propeller and then extrapolate that as how, you know, as far as your scene is. And then uh, that, will, uh, that will rotate through the entire scene. Same with car wheels or anything like that. Yes, sir. Right. Um, the question was, is there collision? Um, in, in the current version, there is not collision. Uh, at the moment, in fact, you just saw she, she passed through one there. Um, there is no collision at the moment. Um, in the uh, iClone 3 release, we have added collision. So you decide what is collidable and what is not. So you'll decide uh, what is terrain, um, what is you know, able to have collision. All of that is, is up to you. Checkbox is really what it is in the next version. So um, I think that's probably about my time. So uh, thank you all very much. If you have any further questions, definitely feel free to ask me. Um, the software, again, you can download a free trial from reillusion.com. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Enjoy the rest of the base camp. First, I want to say what a ple uh, pleasure and a privilege it is to be here. Um, I've gotten to meet a lot of you. Um, a few of you come up to me, and uh, a couple of people said, oh, you're that CNC dude. Um, and uh, you've seen me outside. I've been setting up the machine out there. And after I finish my talk, we're going to get to go outside and uh, watch it in action, cutting something. Um, I'm going to talk about 
I think a few things. I'm going to talk about where I've come from, sort of how I got to where I am now, um, and why SketchUp is so integral to, to what it is that I do, and, uh, and also the ShopBot CNC tool. Uh, Jake's talk, I think, is very related to mine. Um, there are two kinds of digital fabrication, really. There's additive and there's subtractive. Uh, what Jake is doing is called additive uh, digital fabrication. And that's where you're taking a material and you're, you're building something up. I'm sort of doing the opposite. Um, I have a, a, a cutting tool and it takes raw materials and it cuts away parts and it, it leaves something behind. And hopefully that, that something behind is, is going to be useful. Um, I discovered uh, both, I discovered SketchUp slightly before ShopBot, but to me they're both the two most important tools in my shop. In fact, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without them. Um, I have a, a, a digital fabrication shop in San Francisco. I should have brought this up before. And, uh, and I do custom work. I do so many different things. And people have come up to me in the past couple days and said, well, what does that machine do? What can you do with that machine? And it's like asking, well, what does SketchUp do? What can you do with SketchUp? Um, it's really kind of up to the operator. It's up to the user. It's capable of doing a lot of different things. Um, and I find together that's a very powerful combination. Um, so this is just, uh, to get this out of the way, this is my website. You're welcome to go there sometime. Check it out. I got a few pictures online. I think nowadays we've all agreed that all websites are in a state of progress forever. Um, and before we get into what I do and, and how I do it, I want to take a brief moment and talk about a colleague of mine. Uh, his name is Bill Young, and he is another uh, ShopBot uh, user. Uh, he's on the East Coast, and he's working on a really interesting project right now uh, you, through MIT. And it, uh, it has to do with building a digital house, uh, building a complete house using a CNC tool. Um, I don't believe they're using SketchUp, but they could, and it's related, and, and if I can keep my wits about me, I might be able to connect the two things together. But just so you know how to look at his story, if you were to go to the ShopBot Tools website, uh, they have a blog, and you can see right now, this is happening just last month, he's fabricating a house uh, that's going to go into the New York, New York Museum of Modern Art. And this house is completely built with a CNC tool on site. And, uh, and they're going to disassemble it and take it down to New Orleans. That's, that's their plan. So that's a very cool thing. And I really encourage you to, to check that out. I know that there are a lot of architects here. And uh, it's definitely a great thing that they're doing. Um, So this is my tool. It's kind of like the one outside, except it's bigger. And it's a lot dirtier. Um, and this picture was taken a long time ago. It's basically when I first got it. Those are cabinet parts. There's nothing too exciting about them. Um, but it's neat to be able to stand there and drink a cup of coffee while it does the work. And uh, the white pipes down here, that's a vacuum hold down table. Um, that is really key to being able to use a CNC effectively. Having to screw material down or clamp it down, um, it's, it's really inconvenient. And with this, I can throw down a sheet of plywood, I can turn on the vacuum, and, and you have 14 pounds, or well, that's the ideal, per square inch holding that material down. And so you can cut those parts, and they don't move. In fact, the, the, real, the real art and science of using a CNC machine is material hold down. Um, the cutting is the easy part. It's like, if the parts move, they're not going to be right. So this was just a little picture we took. I, um, one of the largest things that ever landed on my machine was this slab of acacia. And it was, uh, started out as four inches thick, weighed over 500 pounds. And uh, it became a, a table for a very high-end client um, who financed it. Um, we surfaced it. 
we pocketed the wood, we did a lot of work on that table, and it, it recently, it was, this was probably a year ago, it only sold, it was in a, a store for quite a while, and it just sold for $20,000. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of wood, and it was a real pleasure to work on. Um, in addition to doing that work, they had an enormous crack right down the center, as you can see, and, and I was able to cut uh, butterflies, like bow ties out of wood, and, and also cut a template that the, uh, the other woodworkers used to route the, the hole for those butterflies to go into, and so that crack was sewn up. It looked like a giant zipper, and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, now, yes? <laughs> well, because we could, and uh, and it was it was more convenient. Um, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't cut the pockets on the shop bot. Oh, I know. But yeah. Why, why not? Okay. The woodworker he wanted to he wanted to take the time to place them by eye. So I gave him the butterfly, and I gave him, and they were all different sizes of butterflies, and I gave him templates for each one. And so he used the templates, and he was able to place them so that they, they fit with the, with the figure of the wood. And um, a lot of people feel that you know, moving towards digital tools takes away the artisanship of woodworking. And, and it's not really the case. So most, most jobs that come through my shop go through SketchUp in one form or another. Um, I don't always do my tool pathing in SketchUp. Tool pathing is when you take a design and you convert it into a, a cut file, something that the machine can understand. Um, in the beginning, when I was just starting up, I used SketchUp a lot more for that. But as I've gotten more sophisticated and I haven't had time to continue to work on the software that I was using for that, I've had to use some other third-party software. Um, but um, for this project, I did use some of my own scripts, basically SketchUp Ruby scripts, to do the tool pathing. Um, this was a architectural model. Um, it was like, you know, as you can see, three feet by almost three feet and uh, two and a half feet. And um, each of those layers was 0 0.05 inches thick. Um, and they needed it in three days. And so I was able to mill those contours out of uh, sheets of material and then layer them up. And uh, at the same time, I can make uh, registration holes or you know, cuts of some kind so that they go together uh, accurately. Um, and uh, this is a staged picture. The, the, the part has been pulled off the machine and put back on to show. You can see the, you can see the, the layer between the sheets of material. Um, but they were really under the gun, and, uh, and we were able to make the part for them over Memorial Day weekend. And, and uh, I don't know if they got the job, but they're, they're, they've got their fingers crossed. Um, I do molds. This is a mold for a chair. Uh, the Bay Area is, is uh, ripe with designers. There are a lot of successful designers, a lot of aspiring designers. Um, this, this was a mold that was used to make another mold that then was used to make a chair. And you can see it's like it's, it's made of many layers. Um, I think it was, I think I ended up going through 14 sheets of material to make it happen. Um, but uh, the chairs are beautiful. You know, they're little comfortable egg-shaped chairs with foam. Now, since I've been such a SketchUp sort of uh, proponent um, in the, the little woodworking and fabricator community that I'm a part of, um, a lot of the other people I've worked with, they've adopted the tool. And so this is the exact model that was given to me by uh, a contractor who I work with a lot. And he was uh, remodeling a restaurant. And uh, so he, he used SketchUp to, to design this restaurant. And uh, I played a part in some of this. Um, I cut out a lot of parts for the benches that you see. And then there was the, the, decorative, the decorative trees that are in that back room. And this was sort of an interesting problem because they didn't want to waste a lot of material. Um, and yet it covers a, a large area, except that those trees are rather thin and spindly. And so to just cut them straight out of sheets of material would have been very wasteful. In fact, I did a, I did a, a little mock-up in SketchUp, and we were getting less than a 30% yield out of the material. And it was going to be, and it was a lot. Um, so I was, a, I was able to design a, a puzzle joint like a jigsaw puzzle. And I broke these trees up 
and there was all there was three walls that are covered with these things, and they uh, it came to 147 parts altogether. I, I uh, threatened the contractor with just dropping them off in a giant box, <laughs> saying just go ahead and put them together. But uh, I was able to. Uh, here's another scene from the SketchUp model. Um, I gave him a key, of course. Every part was numbered, and. Uh, they were very nervous about the whole process. It was new to them, uh, and, uh, but it turned out to be the easiest part of the whole job. Uh, it went together like a dream. The puzzle joints are practically invisible. Um, they sand them a little bit, and they disappear. Uh, so there's the, there's the final result. That's in San Francisco. So a restaurant called Fritz. They serve high-end french fries. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, I, I put this in here. It's a, it's a scene which has a, a match. You can see that there's the model. And there you can see an example of two of the puzzle joints. And this was just put up there to test the placement. Here's the, an example of the type of the key that I gave them. Um, the color really helps the parts stand out from each other. I can cut aluminum. Um, this was part of a signage job. It involved 127 of these aluminum gears. Each one was routed with a name and a, a thank you of some sort. Um, aluminum is very noisy. Um, the CNC tool is, is very enabling, just like SketchUp is very enabling. But make no mistake, it's, it can be hot, hard, dirty work. That, I think, was... Uh, uh, Eighth inch, if I recall. Um, I can cut, you know, you do it in multiple passes. You only go so deep at a time. I mean, there's really the only limit to how thick I can go is the limit of the machine. My particular CNC machine has a six inch Z travel. I was a software engineer for a long time, and I worked in children's software uh, games or edutainment, as we called it at the time, and um, and then. As I was transitioning from that, I got a job with Lego Mindstorms. Uh, Lego had a robotics toy. And, uh, and so at a time, I used to uh, um, use Legos to build robots. And now I'm using robots to build Legos. Uh, because this, you don't see the Lego connector, but this was a prototype for a design which, which uh, I did build a lot of. I built a lot of these things, different shapes, some different sizes. They all connect together like Legos. The dimensions on this model are two feet by two feet by 16 inches. Um, and uh, they're being used in a, in a university setting uh, so that college students can sort of build their own uh, stages and uh, furniture. They can stack them. But they can stack them, and these things, they lock together. Um, here's the the first prototype we made. The finger joints, of course, are the real trick, being able to cut those out. And you wouldn't want to do it any, any other way, um, especially when you have to do as many of these things as I did. Um, here's an example of the bottom of one of the ones. Um, so these rings fit into the negative on the top. And it's a beveled edge, so it's, it's a relatively positive fit. It doesn't lock, but these things are heavy. Gravity does the rest. Um, to get those rings so perfectly, I call this technique a press fit extrusion. Um, I pocketed a ring into the, uh, into the material, and then I cut other rings out of another piece of plywood. And then I think the most pleasurable part of the entire job of building these was being able to put some glue in the groove and then pound them in with a hammer. And then you're done. I do signs from time to time. I did a sign for my girlfriend's father, um, and uh, I think he liked it. This is when I was just figuring out some things. I, got, I decided to build my first uh, piece of furniture, so I designed something. And uh, it's still in the shop. It has flaws, but, but it does work. Um, it's always wise to do a smaller scale model of something before you commit a full sheet of plywood. Um, so there's that. Uh, kind of the beautiful thing is if you design something for, say, three-quarter inch material, 
and uh, you're going to use a half inch bit, let's say, you can just scale it all down. Scale it all down by some percentage that's going to scale proportionally. Scale it down to use quarter inch material. And then you can use a, uh, what would it be? Well, maybe that's not the right bit size. But you can find the right bit that would use the exact same tool path. And you can build the scale model without having to change anything. Um, there's a little layout in SketchUp. This was used to produce the tool path. Uh, there's the, the mama and the baby. Um, a lot of designers have furniture ideas. Uh, this was a pretty cool job. Uh, we did this out of plywood, bamboo plywood. It's very popular these days. Um, and uh, properly finished. Um, it's very strong. It's very beautiful. Oh, we missed the slide. It's going to be coming up. This was a, a walnut stool. Um, you can see the milling marks. There's this, there's the table. So from there to there. Notice how, they, how the faces look paper thin. That's because those holes were cut from the inside with a V-bit. Uh, you may have seen I was doing something yesterday with the V-bit. I was carving a map of the world. And so they, uh, they bevel inwards. I needed uh, some stairs for my shop. In my shop, there's a drop. It's a, like almost a four-foot drop off the street. And when I moved in there, there were these giant crates that were used. And people started coming in more and more. It seemed dangerous. So I was able to design these stairs basically so that they slotted together like a toy. And uh, you can kind of see in the background the, uh, the way that they were cut out from a sheet. And um, there they are. Some weird technical stuff. This is a table, the bottom of a table that goes into a cafe that holds a, a computer, Wi-Fi antennas. Um, this was a case where I got an STL model. And like Jacob said, they're highly triangulated. That's not good for me. I had to clean it up. But um, you can use Ruby to do that. Recently, I've been getting into some really fun stuff. Um, joinery, being able to figure out different kinds of CNC joinery. Um, I think of a lot of these techniques as patterns. I know that in software and in architecture, patterns play a big role in the language that you use to describe things and to manage the complexity that can arise. Um, you know, when I was a software engineer, I was first introduced to patterns through that, you know, through software architecture. And it was only later that I discovered uh, Christopher Alexander's wonderful book, A Pattern Language. And, uh, and I've read that book, and, and uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I, when I do build things that go to a larger scale, um, I think I like to try to incorporate um, a lot of what's in there. Um, I think my, my philosophy in terms of building is I like to think of myself as a, if I could, be a a combination of Buckminster Fuller and Christopher Alexander. I think that would be a powerful uh, pair. But this pattern is a type of joinery. This is a piece of, this turned into a long piece of walnut that was part of a table. It was a part of a table leg. And uh, it's a kind of a cut that you couldn't really do any other way, not efficiently. Um, but the, uh, the woodworker who had asked me to design the joints for his table was, was ecstatic. And the thing basically put itself together. Now here it is on the machine. Um, this part is a little bit of a tricky part. It involves double-sided machining. And so the machine can only cut from one side at a time. If you're going to cut the top and the bottom, you've got to be able to flip it over. And then you have to be able to register it perfectly. And that can be a challenge. But what you do is you use the tool to help you. You use the tool to cut the jig to hold the part. And so those little blocks of MDF, actually it's LDF, it's lightweight, cuts really easily. Um, those were cut with the machine. First I have the machine kind of just scribe a ghost pattern into the spoil board so I can see where the curve, curve is supposed to be. 
and then I can screw those blocks down so they overlap just a little bit. Then I run the file again, and now it cuts them to the perfect size. So I can cut one side of the part, flip it over, cut the other side. That's a technique I use all the time. Here's a, a texture. This was actually designed in SketchUp, although it wasn't, it wasn't a what you see is what you get kind of design. Um, I just used it to create a, it was a, it was a sinusoidal line because uh, in using a ball nose bit, following a sinusoidal line in which there's two parallel lines that are offset by, by one period, I thought you might get a cool sort of wave pattern and, uh, and it's neat. Uh, it's been on my, I've had that on my website for a while and then I've had multiple requests for, to duplicate it in various forms. Um, I think the left is walnut and the right is mahogany. Um, there's a guy down the hall, he just keeps challenging me. He said, can you do that on a curve? It, it barely fit in the machine. And there it is. Um, we're getting close to the end. Um, now, I, didn't, I was facing the other direction now. How many, how many architects are in here? It's a lot. Well, I, I don't have any background in architecture, but I do like to, to build things. And I, I do like the idea of building structures. And I've, I've had this, this passion for a few years now for being able to take a simple geometry that you can combine in different ways to, to, to build something larger, but which uses modular components. Um, and so my first endeavor, I don't know if, I don't know if you guys are going to think this might work. I'm thinking that maybe uh, Cameron Sinclair could use this design for, uh, for some of his, uh, for some of his uh, humanitarian relief. Um, but there's a structure that I, that I made some time ago. It's a, it's a stellated icosahedron. And I wish I could do it again today, and I may, because I did that one with a, with a skill saw in my garage. <laughs> the thing weighs about 400 pounds and uh, takes maybe six hours to set up. But uh, it was, a, it was quite, a, quite a process. Um, I've gotten a little bit better, I think, although I still have this, I still have this sort of idea that, it, that there's, it's possible. And in spite of the fact that, you know, I think that everybody understands that the geodesic domes have a place and that place is not all over the world. Um, there's another family of geometry that, that is actually powerful. Kind of like geodesic domes are powerful, but it's even better. It's, it doesn't involve five-fold symmetry, which if you think about it enough, that's really one of the dome's downfallings is that the five-fold symmetry is, is an unnatural form for human beings to deal with. There are no vertical walls. Um, it's really hard to deal with the angles. It's really hard to deal with the measurements. It's very strong. There's no doubt about that. So maybe there's a middle ground. And uh, there's some other people who've tried this, and they call them, they call them zomes. It's, a, it's another kind of structure. And so I built one. This is, you could call it a knockdown structure, but somehow I don't think that's a good name. Um, because this, this will come, comes apart and goes together. It basically snaps together. It's, uh, it's like a dome, but you notice that those are rhombuses and they're not triangles. And that's a big difference. Um, the bottom ones are squares and then they become more elongated as you go up. Um, at any point, it's easy to create a horizontal surface. At any point, it's easy to create a vertical surface. Um, Another interesting thing in the way that this form diverges from geodesic domes is you could take those panels and maybe buy a couple more and you could build something bigger with the exact same panels. The only thing that has to change is the, the angle at which they meet. You can't do that with a dome. These are, these are pictures from Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, just a few blocks from my house. There we are putting it together. This was version 1.0. There is a version 2.0. It goes together a lot easier. It was fun. It snaps together. I built a lot of structures that involved bolts and nuts, and they're very time consuming. They require tools. 
This requires no tools. Last October, uh, the Maker Fair was happening down in Austin. So I trucked that thing down there after I'd painted it and set it up. And uh, it was a kid magnet, like you would not believe. They would see it from afar and just run. Um, we had a great time. All right, so that's the little show and tell portion. Uh, now what I want to do is uh, I'm going to taunt the, the demo gods by trying to do a, a real-time demonstration of, of one way in which I would use SketchUp to, to take a design and, and create a tool path and then cut it out. And we're going to all be able to do that if you want to follow me down there. Um, I've got the machine ready. There's a little bit of Julia Child going on here. I did do this earlier. I, I, I have pre-cut the form, although I didn't cut all the way through. When I measured the material, um, I measured it at 5 sixteenths. It's actually a 30 second thicker, so I, I cut it and there's a 30 second of an inch left down there. And so when we go down, we're just going to finish it off. But I'm going to regenerate the toolpath from scratch here. Um, and so what we're going to do... Now my resolute, okay. This is partly courtesy of Bill Young. Bill Young has already uh, modeled a ShopBot buddy, just like the one that you have, uh, that we have downstairs. And it's up in the 3D warehouse. So today I grabbed that and I, and I brought it in to sketch up and save the file. But on top of it, I added one of my, my features, this, this green and brown table. That's a particular component that I have, and it's a nested component. There's a few parts in there, and it's, it's integral to what I'm about to do. The, the Ruby scripts won't work without it. Um, and uh, I'll give you all the caveats that this process is, is very restricted. It's very limited. The scripts that do this will only work when I run it. They'll only work, uh, <laughs> they'll only work for, for very well-behaved models, simple models. Uh, tool pathing is, is a difficult problem uh, by well-behaved and, and simple, or uh, you could say proper models. Um, all, of the, all of the components have to have uh, enclosed volume. Every face must face outwards, and the coordinate axes of each component must define how the part is going to lay down on the table to be cut. Which side is up, which side is left, which side is right. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how you would do it properly. The, the, uh, the source code for all of this is up in the Google code base. Is that what you call it? Code.google.com. Hmm? Code code if you search for Zomatic or Zomatic Cam, um, I called it Zomatic Cam. In, in C and C, there are two terms, CAD and CAM. I'm sure you all know CAD, Computer Assisted Design. Um, CAM is Computer Assisted Machining. And uh, in, in my role, they, they go together. They're almost synonymous. So but anyway, we got this, uh, we've got this ShopBot buddy. And we've got the special table set up. And I'm going to go up to the uh, 3D warehouse. And we're going to search for my stuff here. And I made a simple tetrahedral model. And there it is. Let's just put it right here. You can put it anywhere. So when it's selected, under the plugins menu, if uh, you've been, oopsie, what is that? If you install my scripts, uh, you'll get a menu, and there. There's a lot of options. You can kind of do this piecemeal, or you can do it all together. I'm going to go ahead and do the full thing, because I think that's where the real power lies. Say, I'm going to transform this model uh, directly to a part file. 
This is the only way that I know that you can do something quite like this. Um, any other way, you have to use SketchUp, export some DXFs, import them into some other toolpathing software, um, and then create your toolpaths like that. And a lot of things are lost in the translation. We're going to use a one quarter inch bit diameter. Um, and we're going to use a climb cut. There's different ways of cutting. You've got to, when you're dealing with this stuff, you're, you're dealing with the, the real physical world. It's, it's not virtual anymore. And the way that a, a cutting tool, a rotating cutting tool cuts through material um, is very important, especially wood because there's grain. But we're going to give it a name. Uh, this time we're going to call it three d base camp and uh, so there you can see what it did it's hard for me to drive this is it it laid out the parts on the table just the way that I wanted to have them cut out or it did a, it did a it did an attempt at nesting i wouldn't call this a very good nesting routine but but it did do something and uh, and it generated a file and that file was saved into a folder on my computer with the name you saw and it's ready to go. In fact, I just overwrote the file that I used earlier, so it better work. Um, I think that's about it. We, before we go downstairs, um, does anyone have a question? I don't have a price list with me. Um, I use the tool. It's, um, I, I've been telling people that this machine, like the one downstairs, is, is about $10,000. That could be true. It's probably close. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, of extreme value for what it does. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Inside of here, I can show you if we uh, edit this component and we edit this component. You can sort of see the, uh, the green axis and you can see the blue axis. The red axis is running along the outside edge of that, of that uh, strut. And, uh, and so since blue is up, you can see that's why that part laid down flat on the table. Yeah. Now, otherwise, I mean, how would it know? How would it know the intention? Anyone else? Yes, sir. You make them small. Um, there are built-in commands uh, within the control software that runs the tool that will do uh, uh, very accurate arcs and, and circles. Um, and uh, some toolpathing software outputs those commands when it knows that you're dealing with the curve. Um, but I find that if, this, if you make the segments small enough, and uh, generally any circle with 360 segments uh, you won't, at least with the types of materials that I cut, you won't perceive the segmentation. Uh, many times when I import things from AutoCAD, um, they're highly segmented and I have to fix those things because the curves are gone and it's just a really heavily segmented curve and that's not what the intention was. Uh, yeah, I, I know with, with, the, with the laser cutter, yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So that increases the time yeah. as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, with the machining tool like this, almost every part has, has to have a closed loop. So it, it's, it's not going to do anything unless it's dealing with the closed loop to begin with. You can have um, disconnected segments within your tool path, um, but for any, any part like this, that would not be the case. Anyone? One more, yes? Out of a, out of, can you, the, the question is can you do a chain or a chain like linkage out of, let me ask, out of a single piece of material? It could be done, but it would be a trick. Yes. I mean, you'd have to do some cutting and rotating and cutting and rotating. The machine can only really cut from one end at a time. Uh, the, 
Shabbat also makes what's called an indexer. It's like a digital lathe. And uh, depending upon what you're asking, it could definitely do that. It can do uh, barley corn type shapes, pineapple type shapes. It can do through cuts and twisting. I have some, some examples in my shop of uh, twisting wooden balusters, things that you wouldn't ever really see. Okay, I think we're getting pressed for time. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone, and I'm going to head downstairs. Mm -hmm.